I have held a fascination of the ocean since I was young. I believe most children do, with its strange creatures and unexplored secrets. I like to sit at the water's edge, letting my troubles shrink away as I gaze out across an immense body of water that was here long before me and will remain long after I am gone. It is hard to forget your troubles, however, when you have to start worrying about the health of that vast body of water. Plastics have become quite ubiquitous in today's world. They contribute to our daily lives before most of us even wake up and have revolutionized the way we live. Modern medicine would not even be possible without the innovations of plastic. However, everything has a downside and plastics are no different. Like diamonds, plastic is forever. Plastics are non-biodegradable because their long chains of polymers are so heavy and rigid that no organism on earth, even bioengineered bacteria, are able to break them down. It is this durability and low cost that has helped endear plastic to our consumerist society. In place of biodegrading, plastic goes through a process called photodegradation, where sunlight breaks it into smaller and smaller pieces, all of which are still plastic polymers. Polymers that are between 5 millimeters and 333 micrometers are known as microplastics. That in itself is not a crime. It is when plastic enters the waterways and oceans that the problems begin. The majority of plastic makes its way into the ocean by way of terrestrial sources, where the polymers then become distributed throughout the water column in what is essentially a plastic state. The degradation process can take a very long time, with estimates of 400 to 500 years. The ocean can complicate this process since the water cools the plastic, preventing heat buildup and limiting UV light exposure. In 1997, Captain Charles Moore, on his way to Long Beach, California, from Hawaii, passed through the North Pacific Central Gyre, one of five oceanic convergence zones across the globe that accumulates debris. The North Pacific Central Gyre amasses its debris from the entire North Pacific. There were shampoo caps and soap bottles and plastic bags and fishing floats as far as I could see. Here I was in the middle of the ocean, and there was nowhere I could go to avoid the plastic. It seemed unbelievable, but I never found a clear spot. In the week it took to cross, no matter what time of day I looked, plastic debris was floating everywhere. Founder of the Algalita Marine Research Foundation, or AMRF, Captain Moore returned to the gyre in 1999 to conduct a study on the new storm contaminant burden. What AMRF discovered was North Pacific Central Gyre Neustan plastics outweighed zooplankton by a ratio of 6 to 1 and averaged over 300,000 pieces per square kilometer. In 2008, an AMRF Neustan trawl survey of the same area found a dramatic increase in the number of plastics to over 752,000 per square kilometer. Additionally, a joint 2008 study by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's Marine Debris Program and the American Chemistry Council analyzed the samples taken from the southeast of Bering Sea and off the coast of Southern California. It was determined that microplastic debris is present in the neuritic zone. However, many scientists believe that any estimates on the amount of macro and microplastic in the ocean, both in absolute quantities and relative to plankton, are highly uncertain due to the lack of consistent, verified sampling and analytical methods. An attempt to create formalized methods is currently underway. With incalculable fragments of plastic accumulating in the marine environment, the potential exists for marine biota to ingest the intrusive debris. This poses a problem to creatures both above and below the water's surface. Necropsies on seafaring birds like the Lasian albatross have shown consumption of post-consumer plastic that was mistaken for food. Adults also regurgitate this plastic back to chicks, filling their stomach with plastic. 
90% of examined Laysian albatross chick carcasses have contained plastic. AMRF researchers have found further evidence in a 2008 research expedition of plastic ingestion among epipelagic and mesopelagic planktivorous fish in the North Pacific Central Gyre. Out of the 670 fish caught, 35% contained plastic debris in their guts. The fish ingested two pieces of plastic on average, but scientists found as many as 83 plastic fragments in a single fish. An interesting quantitative trend shows on average the larger a fish, the more pieces of debris found. Not all plastic floats at the surface. Approximately half the plastics estimated to be in the ocean are negatively buoyant and are not privy to receiving the sunlight needed to facilitate photodegradation. A recent state survey found that 3% of Southern California Bight's ocean floor was covered with plastic, roughly half the amount of ocean floor covered by lost fishing gear in the same location. The accumulation of debris in the benthic zone can smother habitats and inhibit the gas exchange. The resulting anoxia, a total decrease in the level of dissolved oxygen, in the benthos can interfere with normal ecosystem functions and alter the makeup of life on the seafloor. What is more, as for the pelagic organisms, benthic biota is also subject to entanglement and ingestion hazards. If marine animals are unable to pass the ingested plastic through their digestive tracts, the accumulation of non-nutritive elements may lead to malnutrition and eventual starvation, which could lead to a significant reduction in population. Additionally, the buoyancy of plastic may increase the difficulty of mesopelagic fish to return to deeper waters. Plastic sorb contaminates from the seawater known as persistent organic pollutants up to one million times the level found in ambient seawater. Plastics can also reach contaminants to organisms upon ingestion. Many of these chemicals are endocrine disruptors and can interfere with the production, secretion, transport, binding, action, or elimination of natural hormones in the body that are responsible for the maintenance of homeostasis, reproduction, development, and behavior. When marine life ingests Toxin-laden polymers, they can work their way through the food web to humans. Effects of hormone disruption on humans run the gamut from enlarged prostates, reduced penile size, and cancer, to early puberty in girls, mental retardation, and a propensity to violence. In fish, it is known to cause males to become female or fail to produce sperm. With the pervasiveness of this plastic soup, a physical cleanup is just not practical, or possibly even feasible. Plastics have permeated from the epipelagic down to the hadopelagic. The ocean is far too vast and in a constant state of motion to contain the plastic debris. Furthermore, if one were to find a solution around the magnitude of area to be covered and the extent of fuel such an undertaking would require, there is still the matter of marine life to contend with. Trawling the waters for plastics would also capture phytoplankton, zooplankton, and small surface-dwelling aquatic creatures, all vital portions of the food web. I believe the ideal solution is to prevent the plastic from reaching the ocean and entrust Mother Nature to handle the remainder. Oftentimes, the most efficient way to make sweeping changes is through legislation. Important examples to promote conservation of the world ocean internationally are the 1972 London Dumping Convention, the 1978 Protocol to the International Convention for the Prevention of Pollution by Ships, and the 1988 Annex V of MARPOL. As the key international authority for controlling ship sources of marine debris, Annex 5 restricts at-sea discharge of garbage and bans at-sea disposal of plastics and other synthetic materials, such as ropes, fishing nets, and plastic garbage bags, with limited exceptions. Stateside, the EPA established the Marine Plastic Pollution Research and Control Act in 1987, and the Marine Debris Research Prevention and Reduction Act in 2006. These two acts require the EPA, NOAA, and the United States Coast Guard to study and reduce or eliminate the adverse effects of marine debris. However, given that 80% of the problem stems from terrestrial sources, 
Further regulations are needed to stymie the flow. Several California legislatures have introduced bills in an attempt to do just that. The primary motive for eliminating post-consumer single-use plastic is due to the shortcomings of plastic recycling programs. A 2003 waste characterization study from the Department of Resources, Recycling and Recovery revealed plastic is only recycled at about a 5% rate statewide. Additionally, a report on the statewide recycling rate for single-use plastic bags in 2009, the latest year available, was shown to be an astoundingly low 3%. Californians use 19 billion single-use plastic bags a year, and they cost more than $25 million a year to collect and take to landfills. The average American throws away about 186 pounds of plastic a year, some of which finds its way into streams and rivers, ending up in the ocean. The U.S. has produced as much plastic in the last 10 years as in all the decades before, combined. This figure is likely to go up in the future with an estimated 2 trillion pounds produced by 2050, four times today's levels. A majority of plastics cannot be truly recycled, rather they are downcycled, meaning they experience a noticeable loss in quality when they are reprocessed and are made into lesser grade products. Reheating plastic gives it a heat history which reduces its flexibility. Reheating temperatures are too low to burn off contaminants. Therefore, very few plastics are recycled into the same type of container or product that they were originally. In addition to the failures of recycling programs, several industry associations and unions are in favor of statewide legislation to avoid a confusing array of bans and restrictions that would vary from city to city and county to county. After the defeat of her plastic bag ban, Assemblymember Brownlee's newsletter stated, <laughs> Lastly, additional scrutiny is warranted concerning the safety of plastics on consumers' health. Despite recent findings that plastics may not be inert and are more bioreactive than previously thought, there is no direct government regulation of plastic safety. The closest thing to regulation is the to Toxic Substances Control Act of 1976 that essentially treats plastics as safe until proven dangerous. The chemical industry is quick to denounce any epidemiological studies of plastic. This sowing doubt strategy is similar to the one tobacco companies used for years. The primary opponent to the aforementioned California legislation is the Plastic Division of the American Chemistry Council, a conglomeration of leading manufacturers and trade associations of plastic resins. The member list reads like a who's who of the Fortune 500, including a few that are among the top 100, such as Dow Chemical, DuPont, and the previous number one company, now at number two, ExxonMobil. In a 2010 letter to Assemblymember Brownlee regarding the proposed bag ban, Tim Shustick, the Senior Director of State Affairs for the American Chemistry Council, asserts that
Shestick proclaims that if the use of plastic bags were restricted, it would diminish the efforts of recycling programs. It is argued that a plastic bag ban would force consumers to increase their use of paper bags, which generate 80% more waste and 50% more greenhouse gas emissions than plastic bags. Additionally, it takes 91% less energy to recycle a pound of plastic than it takes to recycle a pound of paper, and 70% less energy to manufacture than paper bags. A very timely objection to legislation against single-use plastic concerns the economy. ACC Senior Director Tim Shustick has stated that the last thing California consumers need right now is to have what amounts to a $1 billion tax added to their grocery bills. It's astounding to think the legislature is seriously considering creating a new $1 million bureaucracy to monitor how people choose to pack their groceries. Keith Christman, another spokesman for the ACC, has also stated that the council was more concerned about what they estimate to be the 1,000 Californians to be put out of work if bans on plastic are passed. Workers don't want training programs. With millions of people out of work, we don't need this today. They want their jobs. Republican Senator Mimi Walters echoed these sentiments when she stated, If we pass this piece of legislation, we will be sending a message to the people of California that we care more about banning plastic bags than helping them put food on the table. In researching this topic, I have found that plastics, in of themselves, are not the issue. The real issue is the rate at which we consume plastics and how those plastics are disposed of afterward. As I stated at the beginning, plastics are partly responsible for some of the greatest achievements in modern society. However, to carelessly toss them into our ocean where life began is not a viable solution. As noted marine ecologist G. Carlton Ray once wrote, the last fallen mahogany would lie perceptibly on the landscape, and the last black rhino would be obvious in its loneliness. But a marine species may disappear beneath the waves unobserved, and the sea would seem to roll on the same as always.